record on to this. All right, great. So now let's go ahead and get started. So today we're basically going to lay the groundwork, right, for Immuno. Okay. So with that being said, can anyone tell me uh, like innate versus adaptive? Like what's the big differences between those as we go in? Just to kind of get an idea of what you may have learned before like watching the videos or looking over this. Perfect. Innate is born with. Adaptive is memory. Yeah, so you have memory with adaptive. Which one acts first? Which one comes into play first? Innate. Perfect. So innate comes into play first, and then innate then activates the adaptive immune response. Okay? And that adaptive immune response comes into play only when the innate immune response can't really take care of the infection. Okay. So, with that being said, when we think of in the immune uh, the immune system, there's two different responses, right? There's an acute response and a chronic response. Now, this is getting more in a little bit into pathology, uh, which we'll cover more when, when we get to pathology. But I kind of want to get your feeling on the differences between the acute versus chronic when it comes to the immune system response, what do you think the acute would encompass? Would it encompass more innate or would it encompass more adaptive? Yes, perfect, encompasses more innate, okay? So you'll see when we move on that in the acute immune response, you get things like neutrophils, you get things like monocytes, macrophages, right? And then when you get closer and closer to the adaptive, that's when you start seeing things like lymphocytes and stuff like that. Okay? Any questions about any of this stuff so far? I really love um, how you guys kind of looked into this stuff beforehand. So we're going to really focus now on the three top goals, right? The lymphoid structures, innate immunity, and adaptive immunity. Now, some of these things we'll see later on, we're literally just touching on them. I'm not going too in depth with it because when we go into differentiation of T cells, T and B cell activation, how we do antigen presentation, it will tie up more with the adaptive immunity, but you will at least be exposed to the adaptive immunity by the time you get to those. Next week, you'll be like, oh, okay, I at least know the adaptive immunity. Now, how do we activate this thing? Okay, perfect. So, and when we come to lymphoid structures, there's a whole bunch of lymphoid structures. So you covered this all in your first year, right? You got the spleen, you got the lymph nodes, you got your lymphatics, you got your lymphatic drainage, right? That's all what this is now going to play on because your immune system is anchored inside of this lymphoid structures. Now, with that being said, they originate outside of the lymphoid structures, which is known as the bone marrow, okay? They originate in the bone marrow, and then they go to these lymphoid structures, either the thymus or your lymph nodes. You, they can even go to your pyrus patches of your intestines, right? And they can do that aspects of it, or even the tonsils, okay? Now, This is the general outplay of the immune system with maturation of these bone marrow cells. So you always start off with a hematopoietic stem cell. Can everyone see this okay? Okay, perfect. So you always start out with a hematopoietic stem cell, okay? These hematopoietic stem cells decide now, I'm either gonna become a lymphoid progenitor cell or a myeloid progenitor cell, okay? Now, a lymphoid progenitor cell produces a lot of your adaptive immunity, okay? While your myeloid progenitor produces a lot of your innate immune response guys, okay? So with that being said, you would then associate myeloid progenitor with the acute and the lymphoid progenitor more with the 
chronic. Okay. But there is a, a, a connecting guy between the two of them. Okay. Can anyone tell me what the connecting guy is between the innate and the adaptive? If not, it's fine. So there's a cell that really is responsible for stimulating the adaptive immune response. And that's these guys, the dendritic cells and the macrophages. But the most important one for you to know is the dendritic cell. Okay. These are the guys that are responsible for the interconnection between the acute and the adaptive or chronic response, okay? So what you'll see when we get the pathology is at the very beginning, you have neutrophils and these mast cells and stuff like that, but mainly neutrophils, right? And then as you get closer to the adaptive, the closer to the chronic, you end up seeing dendritic cells, macrophages, because that's the guy that connects the two of them together. And then after that, you show up with these lymphocytes because that's chronic now set up, okay? So that's essentially how this immune system works. All right, good. Now, with that being said, there's different triggers that you need to know, okay? Different, like growth factors, pretty much. For instance, to take a hematopoietic stem cell and to make a myeloid progenitor cell, you need interleukin-3. I want, you, I want you to literally think of these interleukins and these um, factors in the future that we're going to look at as growth factors, okay? Growth factors or differentiating factors, they can even be um, cell stimulators, okay? But essentially what an, what an interleukin is, is just a message. This is, that's all this is, it's just a message. It's a message that's being sent from one cell to another that's saying, hey, I need you to become this, I need you to do that, I need you to come over here, okay? Kind of like you're sending a text message to someone else, okay? That's what these interleukins are. Now, the one that is utilized for the lymphoid progenitor is IL-7, okay? IL-7 is very important for taking these hematopoietic stem cells and pushing them into things like T cells, B cells, which we'll talk about later, which is all the lymphoid progenitor cells. Okay? Now, there's plenty of conditions that are cancers or um, tumors and stuff like that. And you'll talk about that more in the HML section. Okay. In the HML section, you'll talk more about those cancers and stuff. So this is something that you'll touch on even later in your second cast. Okay. All right. Perfect. Now with the adaptive immune response, we talked about how you form these cells called lymphocytes. So these guys here are called lymphocytes. Okay. Lymphocytes become B cells, T cells, and then these additional cells called natural killer cells, okay? They all have different functions, which we'll break down. With the B cell, they then become what is known as an effector cell. This is after it's been activated, okay? which we'll go more in depth into. After these guys become activated, they become effector cells, which essentially become memory B cells or plasma cells, okay? While T cells then become these effector cells. Okay? such as memory T cells, cytotoxic T cells, and helper T cells. Now, that's all the lymphoid progenitor system. 
with the myeloid progenitor, it's like we just said, dendritic cells are a big guy that connects the two of them. We got neutrophils as well as eosinophils, mast cells, and basophils. These guys are collectively known as what? Mass of basophils, eosinophils, and neutrophils are collectively known as what? White cells. So all these guys entirely are known as white cells. So all of these are known as WBCs. So when you see a WBC panel, it's all of these guys. So these three guys, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, are known as granulocytes. And this was something um, you guys more than likely went over in med in, in your first year, right? Now, a good way that you can remember this is the word Ben, B-E-N. These are your granulocytes. And you can see, and I'll show you later as well, that they actually have granules inside of them, which are their secretory products. Okay, what they release. All right, perfect. Now, with that being said, let's talk a little bit now about the red blood cells. So red blood cells is also created from these hematopoietic stem cells. Okay, and these red blood cells come from different areas depending on where you are in the fetal life versus the adult life. Okay, so you start off in the yolk sac, you go to the liver, then the spleen, and then finally the bone marrow. Okay, there's a mnemonic that they have is young liver synthesizes blood. This is in your first aid book. This is also a good breakdown of it. I have another picture graph here for you where you have, once again, starting in the yolk sac, this is where you can tie into this year one hemoglobin stuff when you went over in resp right with the globin chains you got different types of globin chains here in the yolk sac you have zeta and epsilon that's what the e stands for it's epsilon okay then after that you then develop the fetal hemoglobin which is gamma right until you develop the in the in the bone marrow when you start developing it in the bone marrow is when you start getting beta globin okay any questions about that so far okay perfect now with that being said you just have a general idea of where you can find this bone marrow okay so for instance after after you're 20 or after you're pretty much done with your teens, you no longer see it in your distal long bones. After you're done in your teens, no longer in your distal long bones. It's now in your axial skeleton. Okay? So things like your skull, things like your vertebra, your iliac crest. Yes, perfect. Those type of areas. Okay? That's where you'll you're you'll find this bone marrow. Okay. Good. Now, this here looks very confusing. And let me break this down. When you see this, you see all these cells, right? If you were to take a blood smear, okay, and you wanted to then say, hey, I want to quantify. In your blood, how many B cells you have, how many T cells you have, how many neutrophils you have. Do you think it's a plausible thing to sit there and count everything on, on a blood smear and then try to calculate that to your actual blood level? No, that's not a very applicable way of doing that. If that's how it was, then lab techs would be doing that 24-7 on how long or how often we order our CBC, right? So this is how it's actually done. Okay. 
This is known as a flow cytometric analysis, okay? Essentially what goes on is this. <laughs> you have different cells. Different cells have different markers on them. We'll talk about the markers here later, but different cells have different markers on them, okay? So we take these tags and we tag the markers on the cells. And then we take those cells with the tag on them. Now you can see here, don't worry about the anti, but these guys are essentially tags, right? These are the cells. Okay, we're essentially taking these tags on these cells and we're pushing it through a, a fluid sheath, okay? So this would essentially be your plasma. Okay, and we're pushing this down a single stream and we're shooting it with a laser beam. And as a result, the laser beam then ionizes. Okay, it makes the cell positively or negatively charged. So then we can differentiate, is it positive for this marker we put on it or is it negative for this marker that we put on it? Does that make sense? Okay, perfect. Now, as a result, you get what is known as this type of graph, right? Now, this graph you see here is that graph that we were just talking about, right? That flow cy cytometric analysis. And it's showing you if the tag you put is positive or negative. That's essentially what this is showing you. So for instance, we have a tag for this marker. We're gonna talk about it here in a minute, but you have a tag for this marker. So if it's up high, that means it's positive for this marker, if it's in this quadrant. If it's down below, that means it's negative for that marker, okay? And it's the same thing for this marker. If it's in box one, it's positive. If it's in box one, it's negative. Now in box two, what is it? So if this is positive, if this direction is positive and this direction is negative, this direction is positive, this direction is negative, box two would be what? Positive, perfect. So it's positive for both markers. I'm gonna take a minute now. Does that make sense? Because essentially what you're doing is you're, you're, you're taking two different markers and you're slapping it onto one graph is, is what they did. They took the marker for CD3, they took the marker for CD8 and they slapped it on one graph, which is why the upward direction is positive and negative is on the bottom. And on the X axis, the further away from the intercept, the Y intercept, it's positive and closer to the Y intercept is negative. So that means in this small box here, okay, known as four, they're both negative. So that means you have no marker CD8 and no marker CD3. Okay. Now, perfect. So now these dots here are just telling you that cells were present. So if you had dots in this box, that would tell you that cells are present in that third box. So you are positive for CD8 or this marker. Okay. All right, perfect. Now, here's this one. I want you now to tell me, what does this here tell you?
What does this box right here tell you? Yes, perfect. You're double positive. So you got some cells that are CD4 and CD3 markers. Perfect. If you see this box here, that tells you what? Positive for CD3 only. Good. Negative for CD4. Does that make sense? This also means negative for CD4. Okay, perfect. Great. Now, that's how you read these guys. Okay? You're going to see these guys shown on your tests. You're going to see these guys shown on your quizzes because this is how they quantify if someone's blood has a certain cell that they're looking for. Okay? Perfect. Now, this is just another picture of what we just went over. So three is positive for CD4, yes, and negative for CD3, yes. You are correct. That's exactly what box three here is saying. Good. Now, here is another kind of breakdown that you need to do. So whenever you see one of these graphs, this is how you have to approach it. You have to approach it as one, where did you get the sample from? Because you're gonna see different markers depending on where you get it, okay? If you get it in the bone marrow, you're gonna see more immature markers. Then if you get it in the lymph node, you're gonna get more mature markers, which we'll see and I'll show you later. So that's the first thing you have to denote. Where did I get this blood sample or lymphatic sample or plasma sample from? Okay. And then secondly, is reading the picture. Okay. Good. And we're going to get an example of this on Thursday when, when we do MCQs. Now. This, don't get freaked out right now. This is all the CD markers to some extent. There are a crap ton of them. Okay? So, the only reason why I'm showing this to you is to show you that this is something that we're going to look at later. And you're going to be like, oh, I know exactly where this is coming from now. Okay? But these are the markers that they use. So this box number here, CD20 and CD3, could be any of these guys. Okay? All right. Now, here is looking at the opposite side now. This is looking at your myeloid stem cells. Okay? We looked more at the, the lymphoid. Um, now we're going to look more at the myeloid stem cells. So the other thing we're going to add on to this now is CD markers. Because I said you need CD markers for these guys. So now let's start adding them in so you know. So for instance, CD markers for any of these guys is CD14. CD14 tells you that you have a monocyte, possibly a neutrophil, possibly a eosinophil, and possibly a basophil. Okay? So essentially all of your granulocytes plus monocytes. That's CD14. Okay? CD16 is just the granulocyte monocyte progenitors. So you're only looking at monocytes and neutrophils. Okay? Now, CD16 is also known or shown on other cells, and we'll talk about that when, when we get there. 
Okay, I'm just exposing you to the idea that you got these markers. Okay, and if you see a marker CD14, you got to think more of these granular sites, more monocytes. And then if you see CD16, you think only neutrophils and monocytes right now. Okay, good. Now, I threw in here, these are some drugs. You don't have to know them now. But when you do chapter uh, your second cast, you're going to run across these names. Okay, you're not going to run across them for your first test, but you will at least have them when you run across them in your second test. Okay, and essentially what these guys are, are just the drugs of what your body already makes. Okay, so your body already makes thrombopoietin. Thrombopoietin, what you guys already sh uh, should know by now, right, is that thrombopoietin makes megakaryocytes. And megakaryocytes then make platelets. Okay, yes, that, that's what CSF stands for. It's colony stimulating factor. You are correct. Okay. Now, these guys are just the drug names of what your body already makes. Okay. Now, pertaining to megakaryocytes, megakaryocytes, they get stimulated by IL-11 to become platelets. Okay. Megakaryocytes get stimulated by IL-11 to become platelets. And we'll talk about this guy here later with eosinophils and IL-5. Um, any questions about any of this stuff? You can see how the ILs are starting to get more and more. And the CD markers are starting to get bigger and bigger. This is where Anki comes into play and can kind of help you remember these things. Because when you see on a test, you're going to have a hard time remember, was it IL-5 or was it IL-11? I, I don't remember which one stimulated megakaryocytes. So that's where the active recall comes into play. And I'm telling you now, this is a synonymous thing to foundations with enzymes and memorizing biochem crap. Okay? It's something that you readily lose. So you have to keep studying it to keep it in your noggin. Okay? Especially with these interleukins, because there's no way that you can reason through it. You have to remember it. You can't reason through eosinophils as IL-5. No, there's no way to do that. Okay? So you have to remember those interleukins as well as the CD markers. CD markers... I'll be able to break it down for you a little bit easier. But interleukins, there's nothing else I can do for you. You just got to memorize it. Now, let's talk about the functions of these guys. This is in your first aid, page 416, if you want to follow along in your first aid book and you want to look at that. But I have it chopped up here anyways, um, so you don't have to. But let's look at these guys individually and look at their functions, right? So neutrophils. These are the first guys to arrive. Okay? You get an infection. You get trauma. You get skin necrosis. You get anything like that. Skin death. Organ death. First thing that shows up is neutrophils. Okay? Ingrain that in your brain. The first thing to show up is neutrophils. The reason why I'm saying this is this will make every single organ system in the future so much easier. Because when you get organ death, they're going to have the same breakdown. What happens in the timeline? What's going to happen next? Three days later, what cell are you most likely going to see? This person passed out and a, PM, a paramedic shows up to the, uh, to the scene, takes the, the patient to the hospital, and then arrives to the hospital dead. How long was he dead? You see this on a biopsy. How long was he dead? So they really hammer to you this where you see certain cells. 
And the first thing that shows up is neutrophils. Okay. 100% all the time. All the time. Okay. I cannot stress that any more than what I just did. Now, with that being said, uh, there are certain things that um, you need to make sure that you know is how to identify them. Okay. These guys are multi lobed. Okay. So they got around three to five lobes. And you can see that here in the image. This is one. This is two. This is three. You kind of see this hump here. This is four. And you see this hump here. This is five. Okay. So this is the ideal number for neutrophil, about five. Okay. You'll see in next cast afterwards that this increases in certain conditions. Um, okay. Let's continue. Eosinophils. These guys are very big in parasites, right? These guys are two blue balls. You may have heard it as. Or somebody may have said it as goggles or sunglasses because they didn't want to say blue balls. I, I get it. But um, but that's essentially what it is, right? And that's eosinophils. Okay? And they have these pink granules. That are textbook. Another thing that they can say instead of pink is what? Eosinophilic. Eosinophilic granules. Okay? And sometimes that throws people off. Because they're like, well, I don't remember what the crap kind of color those granules are inside any of these cells. When they're essentially telling you the answer in it. Now, they could say acidophilic as well, but acidophilic is more of a chemistry setup word versus eosinophilic. Eosinophilic is more of a histological word, while acidophilic is more of a chemistry biochem word. Okay, because when you think of acids, that's more going into the chemistry of it. Eosinophil is more the, the color of it. All right, um, perfect. Now, basophils, these guys are packed full of granules, okay? And they're basophilic granules, okay? And you can see that here, densely basophilic. Now, these guys here with basophils, they do a lot with allergic reaction. And we're going to see that later on when we look at um, some conditions and diseases that happens in the immune system, right? Now, the next thing is a mast cell, okay? Mast cell is synonymous to a basophil, okay? However, these are at local tissue sites, okay? Local tissue sites, you see mast cells, okay? So if I was to take a biopsy of your skin right now, and I smeared it on a, on a slide and I looked underneath the microscope, the only thing I would see is mast cells as well as um, dendritic cells and macrophages and monocytes. Um, but I would never see basophils because you see those in their blood, not in the tissues. Okay? The only time you see basophils in the tissues, and I'll show you a little diagram, is whenever you get inflammation. Whenever you get inflammation, then these guys from the blood come into the tissue. But until then, they stay in the blood. Okay? Now, there's a mnemonic to remember the general numbers of everything. So never let monkeys eat bananas. So this is the most. This is the least. At least have that general idea. You don't have to remember what's the second most, what's the third most, what's the fourth most. No. Just make sure you have a general idea. What's the most? What's the least? Okay. Neutrophils is the most, while basophils is the least. Okay. Because you'll see later on, there are some conditions that increase basophils, and then all of a sudden, they're the most. 
and you're like, oh, whoa, 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 this don't make no sense. You should be the least. So this is pathologic. Okay. All right, great. Now, let's continue. Monocytes. Monocytes, these guys are found in the blood, right? And monocytes then become macrophages in the tissue. You got multiple types of macrophages. You got the um, dendritic cells. You got stellate cells in the liver. So all those guys are just locally anchored macrophages. Okay. Now, when it comes to macrophages and monocytes, these guys are marked with two CD markers. CD14, right? And CD16. These are those two markers we talked about earlier. Neutrophils. What are the CD markers for that? If I wanted to see someone had a CD marker for neutrophils. CD14. Was that it? And CD16. Perfect. Good. Make sure you remember both of them. Okay, so neutrophils and monocytes or macrophages have CD14 and CD16 on them. Okay, great. Now, there's another marker that you we'll talk about later that's going to help differentiate the two of them. Um, but that's just the two markers for these guys. Now, as we move on, dendritic cells is, once again, a subset of a macrophage, right? These dendritic cells are the big connector, right? Between the innate and the adaptive. Okay, this is what it looks like in a smear. No. So after the macrophage, after the monocyte has become a macrophage, it stays a macrophage. Even after infection has, has resolved. Yeah, no worries. Now, with that being said, some macrophages, right, they die off because they get old and they die off. So the actual number of macrophages in the tissue doesn't change. But that's a good question. Now, with neutrophils, since, since you brought that up, neutrophils, they always die. And we'll talk about this more in pathology. They always die, and that dying becomes that pus that you see. Okay? So whenever you're popping pimples and you see that white pus come out, right? That's all neutrophil death. Now, those neutrophils go into the infection, and then they ate things up, and then they died. Okay? Now, when I say the pus that comes out, I'm not talking about whitehead pus. I'm talking about like the actual pustule ones that you pop and like they make it curly because they're liquid. Okay. Because the whiteheads are something totally different. That's just clogged up fatty acids. Okay. But the ones that you squeeze and it makes like an actual like pus, that is neutrophils. Okay. All right, let's keep going. Now, here we've already talked about these guys, so I'm not really going to harp too much more on this other than where they're made, okay? So B cells are made in the bone marrow, right? T cells are also made in the bone marrow, which we've denoted, but they mature in the bone marrow as well. Okay, so B cells not only are made in the bone marrow, but they also mature in the bone marrow. While T cells are made in the bone marrow and they mature in the thymus. Okay, so now let me ask you this question. You guys learned back in year one that thymus eventually degenerates into fat, right? 
So my question is this, do you make new T cells after your teenage years? No, perfect. You do not do any more maturation of T cells because the thymus has now mature, has now degenerated in the fat. Okay, great. And because of that, it's because this is where they mature. This is where T cells go to mature. Now, let's keep going on. Um, yeah, we'll talk about it later. So now lymphocytes, you have to know how to identify lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are these guys here. Let me use. Lymphocytes are these guys here. These are your lymphocytes. I don't know why I use black. I switched it by accident. But these are your lymphocytes, right? And these lymphocytes are broken up into those two different types, right? T cells, B cells, as well as natural killer cells, okay? Those are the three guys, okay? Now, plasma cell is the mature version or the effector cell of a B cell, okay? These plasma cells, which we'll talk about later, these guys are responsible for producing antibodies and all that fun stuff. We'll get to it. I'm just exposing you to it now. But the big idea here to, to look at is how to identify it. You see how this area here is less pigmented than the surrounding area or less basophilic? This is how you identify a plasma cell or have a less basophilic area for, surrounded by more basophilic area. Okay. Can anyone tell me what this less basophilic area is? This is something you learned in year one. So this here is the Golgi apparatus. Okay, it's the Golgi apparatus because Plasma cells produce a lot of things that they secrete, okay? So since they're secreting things, they need a lot of Golgi because that's the pathway to produce proteins that are exocytosed, right? So we're making extracellular proteins, so you need a lot of Golgi. Nice, perfect. All right, now... Whoo, that was a lot. Now, we're just taking that info now and expanding on it, okay? Do you want to take a two, three-minute break real quick just to kind of get some coffee, maybe get something to drink, use the restroom, or are you good to keep moving on? Okay, let's take it. Let's come back at 12.51. Okay, and then we'll continue on with this process. I have my coffee right here, and it's a, a giant mug. I love to keep it by my side. I tell you, it's a lifesaver. All right, guys, so we'll come back in a bit, and then we'll continue on.
Okay, is everyone back? We're good to continue. All right, got two yeses. Make sure I'm re okay, perfect, great. All right, let's go ahead and get started then. Now here. So here is the last thing we left off on, right? So we had those different interleukins that we talked about, and now we're moving on to the general outlay, right? Because I said earlier that you first start in the bone marrow. So both of these guys are formed in the bone marrow. These are B cells and T cells. Okay. There is this whole thing with progenitor, and but that's something that we you guys will discuss later during the semester. If I go into it, that alone is going to take about an hour. Um, and we're not going to get through the rest of this lecture. So we're going to leave that to the professors, right, um, to go over. But you also have your videos, which also goes over that. <laughs> but they originate in the bone marrow. Then they go to the primary and lymphoid organs where they then mature. We're thinking bone marrow and thymus. Okay. Now, from there, they mature. They go through medical school. Right, but they've never seen an actual bacteria yet. Just like you guys have never really seen a patient other than actors. Right, that's essentially what is happening right now in the primary lymphoid organs. They're just seeing patient. They're seeing actors right now, but. They then send out themselves to the secondary lymphoid organs. This is where they actually go out into the hospitals, which you guys will do next semester, right? In med three. And you're going to now see patients. This is now where you get exposed. This is now when you get activated by various antigens. Okay. I want to say, yeah, that that's part of your os your um your clinical stuff, right? You start going to the hospitals in Med three. Okay, perfect. So this is where you now get activated. So if I was to ask you, where do you get activated? Bone marrow and thymus should never be your answer. Okay, because bone marrow and thymus is where they mature. They're, they're in medical school. If I was to take a patient and throw a patient in the medical school, uh, the students there be like, uh, I don't even know what the heck this is. I mean, I'm trying to figure out what a freaking an enzyme is right now, let alone who you are. Right? So they don't get exposed in the primary lymphoid organs. You see actors, so then you get sensitized to what a patient really is. You're like, oh, okay. So if they show up in my office and they talk about abdominal pain and stuff, you're a patient. Okay. So that's what's happening there. And then secondary lymphoid organs, they get to actually see it. Now, from the secondary lymphoid organs, they then become those lovely effector cells. These are the guys that are going to do the action. Okay. They become exposed. Now they're doing the job. Okay. So you go through the hospital your first time around. This is your rotations. And then you become residents. And you're doing the job. They don't expect medical students in the hospital to diagnose patients. If that was the case, everybody would probably walk around saying, I got cancer. Oh, a fever? Yeah, you may got cancer now. I looked on Google, Google said cancer. <laughs> so yeah, WebMD, exactly. So that's why they first get exposed in a hospital, right? Going through resident, going through rotations, and then they go through actual residency when you're doing the job, okay? And those are the effector cells. 
Okay? Perfect. Now, this is more the maturation process, which you'll go over more during the semester. I'm going to talk on this a little bit and expose you to this, but you're going to talk more in depth than this in, during the semester. So B cells, when they get activated during the maturation process, they start presenting certain markers inside their, their actual cell to undergo antibody formation, right? They need to start presenting certain cell markers. So as a result, this is what is known as VDJ rearrangement. Don't worry about it, right? This is just exposing you to it. You can watch on your videos if you want to go more in depth. You're going to have like a whole day, pretty much, talking about maturation of B cells. Okay? During lecture in, in the semester. So don't, this is just exposing you that this does exist. Now, with T cells, they have their own maturation, but this happens inside the thymus, okay? With their specific CD markers, which I'm gonna talk on later. Um, Perfect. Now, here we're looking at the actual cell markers now. So now they made them. So we skipped the maturation and now they are mature, okay? So these are mature cells. Okay, on their cell surface, they present this guy. This is known as an antibody. Okay, this is for the B cell. The T cell presents this guy. This is known as the T cell receptor. Okay. Yeah, the T cell is fancy. Exactly. It has, instead of having one arm, you see how T cells have one arm? The B cells have two arms. This is very important with their activation, which we'll see towards the end of this day. Okay. Now, these are CD markers for B cells that are mature. These are CD markers for T cells. So now we've added on the CD markers for B cells and T cells. If you wanna identify a B cell, a mature B cell, then you're gonna look for CD19, CD20, CD21, because CD20 is one of them, or CD81. A lot of times they, they attack this one, CD21, okay? Now, if you're a T cell, then you're going to look for the CD marker CD3, okay? Good. These are for mature B and T cells. Perfect. Now, you may have noticed that there's also this guy. I'm only going to introduce this to you because... This is kind of with the activation process. This is the guy that is responsible for sending the signal inwards. Just like those G-coupled receptors. G-protein coupled receptors, how they send the signal inwards towards the nucleus. That's what these guys do. Okay. They're just not called GPCRs. They're called IG-beta, IG-alpha. Okay. Now, with that being said, how what do they do inside? They activate what is known as NF kappa beta. Just like with GPCRs, you had things like cyclic AMP, you had things like IP3 and calcium. Here we have NF kappa beta. Okay. And this is for both T cells and B cells when they get activated. Okay, now the signal guy for the T cells is the CD3. This is the guy that's responsible for sending the signal inwards and activating NF kappa beta. Okay, 
NF kappa beta then is responsible for producing all the cellular changes that we're going to talk about later. Good? Okay. Now, here we're looking specifically at this guy. We're looking, zooming in on this guy because he's the important one. He has two arms, he's bigger, and this little guy, he's very small, right? He's fancy. And in all reality, people tend to pay attention to people who are not fancy because those are the people that people tend to pick on the most. So here we are paying attention to the guy that's not fancy. And this is the guy, what is known as the antibody. Okay. Now, with that being said, that doesn't mean this guy is not important. This guy is very important. Very, very important. Okay. So. What ends up happening here is this. There's different portions to this. It's broken up into two different protein parts. One is a heavy chain. One is a light chain. One is called heavy because of how big it is. One is called light because of how small it is. Okay? That's why they got the names they got. Heavy chains are big. Light chains are small. Okay, now, with that being said, the, the heavy chain forms different portions to this receptor. One, it forms this thing called the constant region. Okay, this constant region is the thing that is determining the isotype. Okay, the isotype is something we're going to talk about later with how antibodies work and stuff like that. But just be aware that the isotype is what type of antibody you have, okay? So you got different types of antibodies. You got things like IgA, you got things like IgE, you got things like IgG, you got things like IgM. We're going to talk about them, okay? Now, here at the terminal end of the antibody, you have what is known as the antigen binding site. So let me take a minute and explain what an antigen is. An antigen is something that can elicit an immune response. Okay, that is what is known as an antigen. Okay, it's something on a bacteria, something on a virus, something on something that is um, foreign. Yeah, even, even something that's not foreign can be recognized by these antigen binding sites. Okay? Essentially, all they are are recognizing substances. That's all they're there for. Okay? Now, there's different terms. You'll run across these terms later. Also, when you go into, um, when you start Med3, I'm not going to harp on it because it's literally just definitions. So now let's see the thymus. Since we know the thymus, T cells is where they get activated, bone marrow, B cells. Bone marrow is pretty easy to identify. Um, but the thymus, what the heck does the thymus look like? It looks like a sail. Sail on a boat. And they even say sail sign when they do imaging of a kid. Right? They'll do a they say positive sale sign or loss of a sale sign. If I said loss of a sale sign, what do you think that means? Absence of a thymus. Perfect. Which you can see in the George syndrome. Perfect. Okay. Yes, and we'll talk about that stuff when we go over the conditions. Okay, great. Now, once again, this guy shrinks and gets smaller. So what does that look like? Well, let me break this down for you. Bone marrow, right? This is the bone marrow. Bone marrow is where T and B cells come about, right? These are both the immature 
T and B cells are made here. Now, these guys then travel to their very respective locations. One being the bone marrow for B cells. So they stay there. They don't go nowhere. T cells for the thymus. T cells go to the thymus. They go through different checks and bounces to see if these T cells are self-reactive or not. Okay? Just like you go through tests to see if you are competent as a medical student. Do B cells travel to a different region? No. So the B cells don't really travel to a different region. They just stay wherever they're at. But that's a good question. You don't have to worry about if they go to a different location in the bone marrow. Um, okay. But yeah, so just like you have tests, they have tests to see, are you a good lymphocyte or are you a bad lymphocyte? Are you going to go out and kill patients or are you going to go out and save patients? Right? So what I mean by that is this, the T cell can go out and attack yourself, which is autoimmune. Okay. Or it can go out and only attack foreign things. That's normal, which is good. And that's the analogy of saving patients, which is attacking bacteria, saving the, the, the human body that we're inside. Or are you going to kill people, killing the body that we're inside, which is when you react to self antigens? Okay. Good. So leukemia is different. And we're going to, so leukemia is something that you're, you're going to talk about with HML, but leukemia is just an abnormal proliferation of white blood cells that are not doing anything. They're not fighting infections. They're not targeting yourself. They're just taking up space. So when they take up space, it prevents your normal white blood cells from doing what they need to do. Okay. That's fine. I love the enthusiasm because that's going to help push you forward, right? And you're seeing the connections, which is great. Um, The other T cell, see everything as, yeah, I guess you can say it as that. It sees everything as a nail, right? It doesn't have the tools to use something different. Perfect. Now, there's different portions to, a court, to the thymus. And this is something you learned in Med 1. You have the thymic cortex and the thymic medulla. Okay? It's split that way because the thymic cortex is where they're immature and the thymic cortex is where they are mature. So these T cells come in and they transverse inwards. So as you get to the very center, they're mature. Okay? This is for the thymus right now. There are regions for T cells, and we'll get to that with lymph nodes and where they're located at in the lymph node. Okay? Perfect. Now, as you get older, we talked about this, it becomes adipose tissue. And that's what this looks like here. Okay, just filled up with adipose tissue. Perfect. Now, here's the lymph node. So now you became mature. You've learned what you needed to learn. Now you need to go to the hospitals and actually do your rotations. Okay? So now they're sitting in these hospitals that are lymph nodes. Okay? How do they get to these lymph nodes? So they get to the lymph nodes via these things called high endothelial venules, which you were exposed to in year one. These guys are little openings that these doctors or white blood cells go through to enter the hospital or to enter the lymph node. Okay? So think of it as a door into the hospital, these high endothelial venules. They enter here and then they 
present themselves inside the lymph nodes. Now, if you do cardiology, you're going to be in a different location than if you do, let's say, pathology. So once they get into their location in the hospital, they then move to their respective floors. So for instance, the follicles are where B cells are located at. The paracortex is where T cells are located at. This is inside the lymph node. Okay? T cells, paracortex. B cells, follicles. Okay? Now, you also have the medulla, which is this centerpiece here. And you can see that here as this kind of more spacey area this medulla is formed up of cords and sinuses now these cords and sinuses are essentially responsible for holding macrophages okay they hold macrophages, and we're going to get to more of this a little bit later with activation. But just know, in this medulla of the lymph node, you got macrophages here. Okay? Now, the paracortex that we just talked about, that's where the T cells are located at. That's why when certain conditions like the George, you don't have a paracortex. The paracortex is gone because there's no T cells, but you have follicles because those are where the B cells are located at. Okay, good. Any questions on any of this so far? Am I going too fast? Am I going too slow? I can speed up, I can slow down. No, okay, good. All right, perfect. Now. You do have to have a general idea of lymphatic flow. Once again, this is year one throwback. Antigens and dendritic cells. Why are dendritic cells here? Because this is the connecting guy. Innate and adaptive. Okay, that's why he's located here. The dendritic guy's here. So antigens and dendritics cells are coming in through the lymphatics, the lymph, right? And they're entering these spaces called the subcapsular space. They then go on to the trabecular sinuses and so on and so forth. But they leave the efferent. They come in the afferent. Okay. Now, you can see how there's multiple afferents to one efferent. The reason for this is because you want to slow down that lymphatic drainage out of the lymph node. So as a result, you get what is known as an area of stasis. Stasis just means no movement. So this allows those T cells and B cells and macrophages and dendritic cells to kind of intermingle with one another. And become best friends to know, hey, here's this antigen and it's not going away. I need you to come out here and take care of this for me. Me, as a first responder, being EMS, can no longer take care of this issue. I need you now to come out and fix this as a doctor. Okay? Great. Here is the paracortex, which we talked about already. Um, here's the image that is a throwback from Med 1. Or not Med 1, it's like Year 1. Okay, so now this is the spleen. We talked about the lymph node. The second um, lymphoid organ is the spleen. The spleen is the same concept. You have follicles. Or B cells. The other area you have now is not the paracortex, but the 
para-arteriolar sheath. You see, both areas have T cells, have P's in them. They start with P's. Parafollicular, periarteriolar lymphatic sheath. Okay? While B cells are always found in follicles. This is the same throughout the body. Okay? Now, with that being said, these germinal follicles, which I, I haven't touched on yet, have different layers to them. Just like as a cardiologist in a cardiology ward, you have different layers to it. You have medical students who just came out of med school. You have people who've been there and experienced. You have people who are doing their fellowships. You have people who are doing rotations. So there's different levels of doctors. Some are not as experienced. Some are very experienced. It's the same concept inside of these germinal centers. Um, here it is. So, or these B, these B zones, right? So the germinal center are the most active guys. So these guys have seen antigen and are now producing antibodies and doing the job. Okay? While the mantle zone is more guys just sitting back watching. They haven't seen their antigen yet. Okay? Now, the last area is the marginal zone. The marginal zone is where you have B cells and macrophages. Okay? Now, these B cells are the same type of B cells you see in the mantle zone. The only thing different is you have macrophages here as well. We're going to talk about how important this is later. Okay? Any questions about any of that? I know it's a lot of stuff, but once again, guys, this is just exposing you to it. You're going to read, you're going to you can rewatch the video, you can, you know, look and watch those boys and beyond videos to help build the graph. And we're going to do questions on Thursday. Great. Now, there are additional things you do have to make sure you know pertaining to this. This is splenectomy. So when you remove the spleen, certain things happen. One of which is lymphocytes increase, which makes sense because if you're not storing them in the spleen, <clears throat> bless me, if you're not storing them in, in the spleen, they then store in the blood and they float around. Okay? It's almost like you removed a hospital. So as a result, you got more people trying to find rotations. Okay? Now, platelets is the same thing because inside the spleen, you get platelets that get eaten up because the spleen also is where damaged red blood cells and platelets go to die. This is the graveyard of those guys. Okay? Now, the graveyard of these guys is known as what? The white pulp or the red pulp? This is something you covered in year one. So the white pulp is the immune cells. That's this stuff. A good way to remember it is white is for white blood cells. The red pulp is red because of red blood cells. Okay? So that's the difference between red pulp and white pulp. In the red pulp, you had red blood cells and platelets that go to die. Okay? Good. Now, with that being said, if you damage the, the spleen, you then present with certain cells that are abnormal because they would have then been removed from the blood, but they're no longer removed from the blood. Okay? 
Now, you don't have to worry about what these guys are, what they look like right now. Just know, moving forward, that abnormal red blood cells get removed by the spleen. You remove the spleen, you have abnormal red blood cells in the blood. Okay? Good. So it's not as bad as you think. These target cells and how will draw bodies, they don't cause any pathology. It's more of a finding that you see whenever you have someone who does not have a functioning spleen, like in sickle cell disease, or who is missing a spleen. Let's say they get in a car accident and they fracture ribs located at what rib number? Nine through 11 on the left. Perfect. Nine through 11 on the left. Then you can have these howl jolly bodies, these target cells popping up in the blood, as well as him bleeding out because the spleen has a lot of blood flow to it. Okay. All right. Perfect. Now, here we get to the response. So, these T cells. And these B cells, these guys are naive. Just like you and I are naive to what the real medical world is until we actually become doctors. Okay? Yeah, we've been experienced to it. We've walked around. But we haven't been responsible for someone's life or death. I mean, you may if you coming in from like another place and coming in that way. But majority of us are naive, right? Now, with that being said, these guys go to the secondary lymphoid organs. Where they then become activated. In the lymph node, B cells are where? follicles perfect and the t cells are where in the lymph node paracortex perfect and the spleen b cells are where Follicles again. And T cells are where? Periarteriolar lymphatic sheath, also known as PALS. Okay. Periarteriolar lymphatic sheath okay good now afterwards they then become effector cells any questions on any of that okay perfect now here is a very important thing that you need to make sure you know moving forward. I've posted this for you. It's on page 97 in your first aid book. This is all the various areas that lymph drains. Do I need to know this? Yes, you do. Is it really hard to know? Yes, until you really learn the general just of it. Okay? The general just of how blood flow from the skin goes. It goes to your axillary if it's above the belly button. Below the belly button, it goes to your inguinal, your superficial inguinals. Okay? My advice to you is this. Do it on yourself. Okay? 
okay? As you're reading this, do it on yourself. Okay, head and neck, where does that go? It goes to my cervical lymph nodes, which is why you palpate the cervical lymph nodes. Okay? Now, there are some of these guys that are a little odd. I threw them in here for you, such as the bladder. The superior portions of the bladder is different than the inferior portion, okay? As well as the cervix is the same idea. The, super, the upper portion is different than the lower portion, okay? And the legs are different. The lateral portions drains into superficial via going through the popliteal. The medials do not. They never touch popliteal. They go straight to the superficial inguinals. Oh. <laughs> so, no, that's not a Pokemon ball, but... <laughs> It's just to say the, the superior and external portions, right, for the prostate. But, um, but yeah, <laughs> I guess you could think of that. I would have had to make the bottom white, though. The bottom would have had to have been white, right, if it was a Pokeball. Oh, I don't think I can make it white. Like, it has to be, like, shaded in like this. There you go. There you go. Now, now it's a Pokeball for you. Um, okay, great. So there's that. So now that's all of the basics. Okay. Now we're talking about innate immunity. We're seeing how does the innate immunity work? Okay. We know innate immunity encompasses neutrophils, encompasses basophils, encompasses um, macrophages, right? Which one of these is the first guy to show up? Yes, natural killer cells are incorporated in that. Neutrophils. Good. Do not forget that. Neutrophils. Okay. So here we are looking at the differences between innate and adaptive immunity. Okay. This is right around that page 97. Now, you have different portions. In the innate, we talked about neutrophils. We talked about macrophages. We talked about how you also have natural killer cells here. Okay? We did not talk about complement, which we will have a separate day for. And then this is the last piece. The general barrier of your skin is part of your innate system. That mucociliary escalator in your respiratory tract is part of the innate immune system. Okay? Your saliva, your gastric acid, the acidity of your urine, all of these are innate immune responses. Okay? You are born with these things. Perfect. Now, these are germline encoded, okay? They are not specific. They target anything that's foreign, okay? And it's rapid. And because it's not specific, there's no memory behind it. If you get infected with X, two weeks later, you can get infected with X again, okay? Now, this is where you we bring in this idea of immunodeficiencies. If you lose the adaptive immunity, this is why they get recurrent infections because the innate immunity has no memory. You get infected with bug A, you get infected with bug A again later. But someone who has an adaptive immunity, they get infected with bug A, they won't get infected with bug A again. Okay? So someone who has issues with the adaptive immunity 
they get recurrent infections. And this is why. No memory. Now, here's that NF kappa beta that we talked about that also deals with not only T cells and B cells, but here also with the innate immune response. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So here's our macrophages. Woo! CD14. We talked about that. That's a marker. This marker is for what is known as lipopolysaccharide. We're going to talk about this when we do. Sorry, let me write this down. When we do bacteriology. Okay, when we start off with bacteria and we talk about the basis of it, we're going to bring this lipopolysaccharide back. And I'm going to talk about macrophages again. Okay, now another name for CD14 is toll like receptor 4. Okay, now the FC portion is also known as CD16. You remember how I said that on macrophages, the two big markers for a macrophage is CD14 and CD16. Here you see them again, CD14, CD16. But now you see the functions of what they do which you do need to know, okay? Now, the functions of CD16 is for binding of the antigen. This antibody here that we just learned about earlier with the heavy chains and light chains, they bind here to the FC region. We're gonna talk more about this later, okay? Now, complement, we're gonna talk about that later. As a result of activation, these macrophages are originally known as M0. M0 means inactive. Okay? Then they become activated. When they become activated, they become what is known as M1 or M2. The big thing to remember is M1 is for inflammation. You see how this one kind of looks like an I? Okay. So inflammation is M1. Now, can anyone tell me when a macrophage gets activated, what does it release? When a macrophage gets activated, what does it release? IL-1. What else? There's five things. These five things I'm going to ingrain into your head. IL-1. IL-6. IL-8. IL-12 and TNF-alpha. These are the five things that these guys release whenever they get activated. This is important. The reason why is because this is what is going to cause inflammation. Okay? So, Every immune response to a bacteria, to a virus, to tissue damage, not to allergies, but to any of those guys I just pointed out to, starts with this. IL-1, IL-6, IL-8, IL-12, TNF-alpha. They see the microbe, the microbe gets activated, the macrophages, they then release these cytokines. So I love your enthusiasm. And yes, you are right. I will touch on that again.
you are right. You are 100% right that that is the LPS. No, don't turn off your brain. Don't do not do that. Okay. Because I love the interaction and I love your asking questions and making the connections. Okay. So do not do that. Right. I love that you're doing that. I just, I don't want to say more than just yes. You are right. Okay. I just smiled because I was like, I was like, yes, th that's good that you made that connection. Okay. Perfect. Now, the next question is this. If we have these microbes, what about crystals, right? Because people get gout and gout is, is due to crystals in the joint. Crystals is not a receptor. There's not a receptor that's for a crystal. Please, if there's a crystal out there, buy into this small receptor on my body. No, okay? That's not a thing. So instead, these cells get stressed when you get crystals, right? They're sharp. They're sharp little crystals and they start poking the cell. And when they start poking the cell, the cell gets stressed out like, hey, you know, stop poking me. I'm a bear. I'm about to get mad. And then they get mad. And when they get mad, they activate what is known as an inflammasome. Okay? And these inflammasomes activate IL-1. And this is the thing that leads to acute inflammation. Okay? So that's how this is different with crystals versus bacteria, viruses. Okay? They release these cytokines, which are IL-1, IL-6, IL-8, and TNF-alpha. Okay? Any questions on any of that? Okay, perfect. Good. So now let's keep going. Now, why did I have this blank page here? Oh, this blank page is nothing. I think I just had that blank page here because I was doing something else. Okay, so let's move on. So now here we see, so crystals are, it's fine. So crystals are a precipitation of insoluble um, substances. So for instance, in gout, this is uric acid. Uric acid can precipitate out and become uric crystals. You see this in that biochem condition called Lisch-Nyan syndrome. Okay. HGPRT. Yes. Perfect. You can also see it in people who eat a lot of fatty foods or meats, anything that increases the uric acid content. You can also see this in a um, condition with called erotic aciduria. You can see the same concept, right? So these are the things that correspond with forming crystals. Okay. And that's probably why they had that as a CAS MCQ, because it's a tie in now to immuno. Okay. It's pulling that forward. So they're making sure you at least know this stuff because you're going to touch on it in next year or next semester. Great. Now, here's the cytokines. These interleukins, right? These are just cell signalers. I've already talked about it. IL-1, IL-6, TNF-alpha, IL-8, IL-12. Okay? Burn these into your brain. Macrophage is activated. What is released? IL-1, IL-6, IL-8, IL-12, TNF-alpha. Okay. Good. Okay? This is something I will ask you constantly. Now, these guys do different things. IL-1 is big for fever. We're going to, you're going to see that here in a minute. TNF is big also for fever. 
but also deals with something called granulomas. And we're going to talk on that when we go to pathology. Okay. IL-8 is really big, big for neutrophils. IL-6 is something known as an acute phase reactant. So when you get infected with some inflammation, IL-6 is produced, as well as all the other I ILs, NTNF-alpha. IL-6 goes to the liver and tells the liver, we got an infection. We got inflammation. Something's going on here. You need to now change the blood composition to make it less favorable for a bacteria if that's what we got. And you need to now start producing more clotting factors so we can patch up this area that's damaged. Okay? That's what IL-6 does. IL-6 is your text message to the liver. Hey, liver, you need to make these guys. And the liver replies, okay, I'm making them. Okay? Now, these are the respective acute phase reactants. We're going to touch on these down the line, but you can see how fibrinogen is part of your clotting factor cascade. Okay? Hepto, uh, hepcidin is part of your iron cycle with absorption. You talked about that in the GI system. So this decreases the iron available for the bacteria to use. Okay? Now, you also got things like procalcitonin, which is utilized to break down or prevent the utilage of calcium for bacteria. Excuse me. C-reactive protein. This is big for what is known as opsonin, and we'll talk about that later. Um, yeah. And then there's certain things that get decreased. For instance, proteins. Proteins are reduced because you don't want to give these guys, like bacteria or viruses, the ability to break down or take up these proteins, break them down, and then use up the amino acids from the proteins. So your body decreases releasing of proteins. Okay? It's all to help prevent and fight off this infection. Now, this is the cardinal signs. We're going to touch on this again when we go do pathology. So I'm not worried about it now. But... These interleukins are the guys that cause the cardinal signs. Okay. Now, neutrophils we already talked about. What's the CD markers? Fourteen and sixteen. Perfect. What does 14 responsible for? Toll-like receptor, perfect. What is 16 responsible for? Antibody binding. Okay, this is the FC portion of that antibody or that constant region, okay? So this is a constant region. And look at that. I guarantee you, you've probably got two, maybe three questions on your actual test and CAS that you got months away under your belt already because this is the crap that they're going to throw at you, okay? Now, let's keep going. Now, here we're going to break down how do we now get these white blood cells out of the blood, right? Because you got to think, in your white, in your blood, 
you have different cells, okay? You have macrophages, you have mast cells located in this direction. You got various dendritic cells located here, okay? And in the blood, this is where you got things like red blood cells, you got things like lymphocytes. You got things like um, neutrophils. You got things like monocytes located here. You got things like basophils that are located here. But in between them, you got a capillary wall. You need to break down the capillary wall to allow these guys to come in to the tissue. Okay? So, that's what this here is showing you. These are ultimately those neutrophils, those basophils, those monocytes, all doing the same mechanism. But here we're mainly focusing in on neutrophils because they are the what? First, yes, that is why. Now, with that being said, here we got this breakdown. E-selectin is not present on all cells because if that was the way, right, these cells would just be leaving the blood everywhere. But that's not what happens. They only leave in certain areas where you got inflammation or something that's abnormal and foreign to the body. Why is that so? Because of our lovely guys released from the macrophages. DNF-alpha, IO-1. This is released, which allows E-selectin to then be present on the outside. The second E-selectin gets present on the outside, these guys can then bind to the cell wall or the endothelial wall and then start the process of coming into the tissues. If TNF-alpha and IL-1 is never present, E-selectin is never present, and these guys never enter the tissue. Okay? Now, this is the guy that's present on the cells of the of the that are present on the neutrophils called Salo Lewis. Salo Lewis is the actual cell receptor for it. It binds to it, it's a cell adhesion molecule, and then from there it then slows down these neutrophils. Because you gotta think this is blood here. So things are moving fast. So the first thing that happens is it's rolling, it's margination. So it comes to the cell wall, or not cell wall, to the vascular wall. And then it starts rolling on this vascular wall to slow it down via these E-selectins. Then you get tight binding, which is via ICAMs. ICAMs are stimulated via what? What do you think ICAMs are stimulated by? What causes them to come up and be like, here you go, on the outside of the vascular wall? What do you think? What do you think would stimulate these guys to show up? Inflammation. The same thing. Okay, it's the same thing that you get when you see something that's foreign. Okay, these guys get presented and then they anchor themselves via the LF1, LFA1, also known as leukocyte functional adhesion one. Okay, and then from there, it stops. The, the neutrophil stops moving. So it can then diapedese, which means cell movement, into the tissue. 
okay? Which is what happens here with the PCAM. Now it's moving inside the tissue to its target. Okay, any questions on this? All right, so this is the same thing that I just went over. The only thing different is that now it's broken down into first aid breakdown, okay? So here you see the P-selectins uh, and whatnot. They have a little bit more information, but you'll also go over that during the semester, right? These guys are important, but we're gonna talk about them again later. These are those chemotaxics that cause the neutrophil to know where the heck to go. If I come inside a battlefield, right? If I end up entering a car wreck site, I don't know where to go when I get there. Someone needs to tell me where to go. Oh, we're in the ambulance off to the left. Oh, okay, I'm coming to the ambulance. That message of where you're at are these guys in the body realm. Okay, that's them telling the doc these these cells or these doctors or these first responders where to go. This is where thick and thin filaments come in. Yes, so this is more thin filaments, not thick filaments, because thick filaments is more for movement of vesicles inside the body, like in inside the cells. But thin filaments with actin is when you deal with diapedesis. Okay? I hope that helps answer that question. So there's also a condition with that, but we're gonna talk about that later, but that's where this thing known as West Scotch Aldridge syndrome comes into play. Because when you talked about microtubules, there was a protein that had to deal with the actin filament and the depolymerization and repolymerization of it to allow it to undergo diapedesis known as the WASP protein. And we're going to talk about that when we get there. Yes, the WSP. Perfect. Or WASP. It's either one. Okay. Great. Let's keep going. Now, here is a condition that can happen because of a failure to have that LFA1. If you don't have LFA1 or leukocyte function and associated antigen 1, you don't allow these neutrophils to get tightly bound and enter the tissue. So as a result, do you think you would produce pus if you had an infection? No. And that's the main symptom you get in this disease is no pus. Now, other things you can present with, other than no pus, is the aspect that things don't degrade properly because these neutrophils have in them lysosomes, right? And when they die, these lysosomes rupture open and release all these enzymatic enzymes that break down the tissue. So certain things like umbilical cord removed being um, falling off won't happen because neutrophils won't come into the tissue. They won't burst open, releasing the, the enzymes from, from the lysosomes to then break down the tissue to allow the umbilical cord to fall off. So that's also a symptom that you see in this condition, okay? Now, with that being said, they could throw it at you multiple ways. It's also known as CD18. It's also known as beta-2 integrin. And it's also known as LFA1. Do you need to know all of them? Yes, you do. Does that suck? Yes, it does. 
Is there a way to, to memorize it that's easy? No, I'm sorry, there's not. So you just got to memorize it. I'm sorry. Um, okay. So let's keep going. I'm going to finish off. Oh, I don't know if I can be able to finish this off. Um, yeah, well, I'll finish off this and then I'll leave this adaptive immunity. I'm going to do this on Thursday with addition to doing MCQs. Okay. Cause I want to go over it. I, cause I need to go over this. Right. Um, okay. So yes, Thursday's our next class Thursday at five. Yep. It will be Monday, Thursday, five to seven all the way through until our last week before you start class. It's just Monday. Cause we got 13 classes all, all together. Um, okay, great. So here we're looking at how do these neutrophils now, since they got into the tissue, how do they break down the bacteria? They break it down via this enzyme, NADPH oxidase, which you were exposed to in the semesters before. Okay. This is a guy that tied together with the HMP shunt, right? G6PD deficiency. Now, this ultimately makes this, which is known as hypochlorate or bleach in the body. This is why um, Donald Trump was like, oh, all we need to do is we need to drink some bleach because our body naturally makes bleach. No, that's bad because would you drink bleach it doesn't go to these neutrophils and they use it. That's not how it works. So, but your body does make bleach. Okay. But, um, and, and, if, and if you're a Donald Trump supporter, I'm sorry. I, that is just clinically not correct. So I, so that's something that even if you are a Donald Trump supporter, you have to acknowledge. Um, <clears throat> so let's, let's move on. So that's the, the actual aspects with this guy, with the respiratory burst. Now we're going to see later that this is stimulated by what is known by interferon gamma. Interferon gamma is no different than an interleukin. No different. They're the same. Okay, interferon gamma, interleukins, they're just messages. Okay. Now, with that being said, there is a condition called chronic granulomatosis disease. I'm going to touch on this again later, so I'm not going to harp on it now, but it's based on this being messed up. Okay. Now, after you break down these bacteria what happens you then have these little itty bitty pieces of a bacteria or little itty bitty pieces of the antigens these guys get presented what is known on an mhc2 and that's where we end with neutrophils and macrophages, all of those guys that eat things have this MHC2 that allows them to then interact with the adaptive. We're not going any further with this because we're going to harp on this with adaptive immunity. Okay? Just know that that thing they ate up and the thing we've been working on with the neutrophils undergoing migration and bi or, or margination and rolling and binding and diapedesis and margination and then finding their location and then undergoing um, phago like phagocytosis and eating them in and then undergoing the phagolysosome and the phagolysosome then breaks down the bacteria or whatever it is and the lysosome 
And then you have these parts that then fuse with an MHC2 to activate the adaptive immune response. Okay? This is the same concept, but is now for MHC1s. And these are for internal antigens. External, internal, because viruses infect cells. So they're inside the cell. So as a result, you have to have some immune response for them. We'll get into that. But they take these viruses inside the cell and they present them on MHC1s. Okay. Now, natural killer cells, these are guys that are cells that go around killing things that do not have MHC1. If you do not have an MHC1, it says you need to die and it kills it off. Okay. Now, how does it do this? It does this via por porphyrins and granzymes. Okay. So the big distinction here was that MHC1 is for internal antigens. MHC2 is for external antigens. That's the big distinction between the two of them. Yeah, no worries. So, yeah. So natural killer cells, like we said, these guys are killing things that do not have MHC1. That's their main function. Okay? Now, when you watch videos, you may come across something like this. Okay? Essentially, all it's doing is saying, do you not have an MHC1? And if it doesn't have an MHC1, the cell dies. Okay? Now, here's a recap of all those other cells we talked about. We're going to look more at dendritic cells later because that's the connection really between adaptive and innate. Eosinophils, not really a big thing here because this is more for parasites. These guys we touch on when we talk about allergies. Okay? Any questions about any of that stuff? Because now it's the adaptive immunity and I'm not going into that topic because that's going to be like 20 minutes and I don't want to keep you much longer because I've already kind of harped on you guys. Yeah, you want me to go over this graph? Is that what you're talking about? What graph are you talking about? Positive, negative. Okay, so let me go over that real quick. So this graph here, right? This is essentially telling you if the cell is positive for a certain marker. Okay, so for instance, if a cell is positive for a marker, it will be in the upward position because this is positive, this is negative. This is positive, this is negative, right? So with that being said, if you're in the higher portions, then that means you're positive. The lower portions, you do not have it, okay? So with that being said, you look at each thing individually. Do not look at them both together. So right now, just look at the CD3 on the bottom. Okay, 
that means all of this here and this side is negative. All of this here is positive. So that means this is CD3 positive. And all this is CD3 negative. Does that make sense? Now, at the top, you were saying on the, I guess I would say the y-axis, what you were saying is negative to bottom and it's going up positive. I get mm -hmm. that with the okay. anti-CD3 going to the far right, where okay. the CD3 is positive. Okay. But then when you come over here and you say that this is negative and I'm seeing a positive sign, I guess that's what's throwing me off up at the top where you have negative. Oh, okay. So... It's because you're looking at each one of them separately. So when okay. we look at CD3, it's that way. But then when you look at this one, CD20, this up here is now positive. Okay. This down here is now negative. So you got to look at them as two separate graphs. Gotcha. Merged onto one. Okay. Okay. So, and as a result, you're able to then say, oh, this is CD20 positive. Right. CD3 negative. Mm -hmm. Okay. This yeah. is CD20 positive. CD3 positive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And then this would be what? That would be CD3 positive. Okay. And? And CD20 negative? Yes. Okay. Is it, okay, negative or positive? <laughs> negative. negative. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then okay. this one would be what? This would be, it's negative? For both. So... Help me with that because <laughs> I'm look. I guess I'm looking at it together. So yeah. So since you're looking at it together, you gotta think of it like this. Remember that this up here was positive. This right. down here was negative. Right. When you're looking at the y-axis, when mm -hmm. you're looking at the x-axis, this right here is positive. Right. This right here is negative, which is why this is now double negative. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I got okay. it. Okay. Makes sense. And that's how this is broken down. Okay. We'll have a question on Thursday over this. Okay. All right. Thank you. So you can apply it. Yeah. Um, I was trying to understand how to use the pass tracker. Okay. I'll go over that. So the video will be accessible through the link. I'm going to, here, let me stop this video now so it can take time to load.